Well, uh, good afternoon. I'm really excited and uh, honored that everyone is here with us today. Uh, my name is Corrine Taylor. I'm Director of Federal Legislative Affairs for We Act for Environmental Justice. Um, appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to, um, and also during this challenging time. When we first began uh, planning this, uh, what would have been a congressional briefing in person in December, we couldn't imagine just how things would change not only in the country and in the world. And so before we get into the meat of our discussion, I just wanted to take a brief moment of silence to recognize all those who've been impacted by COVID-19, the, um, the pandemic, pandemic that we're experiencing not only here in the country, but internationally, um, recognizing our uh, doctors on the front line, our nurses, medical staff, um, first responders, and anyone else whose livelihood has been impacted. Um, so just a quick moment of silence. Thank you. Today's webinar is on health impacts of toxic personal care products and cosmetics on women and girls of color. And this will be an informative discussion about toxic chemicals and beauty, hair, and personal care products and ways that product manufacturers and retailers are working to bring toxic free products to consumers and proposals that are being presented to the U, um, U.S. Food and Drug Administration guidelines for consumer products in line with what we know about ingredients. The federal law that, that governs this $84 billion domestic cosmetic industry is only 2.5 pages long, just two and a half pages long, and it hasn't been updated in more than 81 years. The very same cosmetic industry uses roughly 10,000 industrial chemical ingredients and in personal care products and the vast majority have never been assessed for safety by any publicly um, accountable body. So this webinar will feature an overview of the Safe Cosmetic and Personal Care Act of 2019, which was authored by Congresswoman Jan Tchaikovsky, and which calls for an immediate ban on more than a dozen of the worst chemicals used to produce beauty, hair, and personal care products. The bill also calls for funding research that will lead to safer alternatives and require full disclosure of ingredients and public education campaigns for women of color. Um, we Act and the Breast Cancer Partnership were early supporters of this bill and be because of its strong language around fragrance disclosure and now our ultimate goal is to influence the Cosmetic Safety Enhancement Act which is HR 5279 um, and make sure that that final bill has stronger language to protect women uh, women of color and girls, but of course the uh, broader, um, just the broader consumer base. So before we begin, I'd like to turn it over to um, Mrs. Peggy Shepard, who is the co-founder and executive director for We Act for Environmental Justice. Again, thank you for being here today. We have an opportunity to support legislation that can begin to make a difference. You will hear today about the extent of the problem and how we can work together to get the most toxic products off of our shelves and to safeguard our health. So thank you and let's be program. All right, well, thank you, uh, Peggy, for that great introduction. And I will just ask that um, folks bear with us, with all of us being on our Wi-Fi's at home and the internet, I think maybe being overloaded, we may have a few technical issues here and there, but um, if you just bear with us, we'll try to make sure that folks catch up. So um, thanks for that in terms of your patience. And I'd like to uh, now turn it over to our first panelist, Dr. Jasmine McDonald. She's the Assistant Professor, Department of Epidemiology. Well, I can begin. Um, I can just give a brief background of myself. So um, I'm Assistant Professor in Department of Epidemiology at Melman School of Public Health. I'm very interested in uh, breast cancer epidemiology, specifically looking at how we can um, reduce breast cancer risk across the life course. So exposures across the life course, can we mitigate them? Can we reduce them? And how will that play a role in our breast cancer risk trajectory? Um, so to begin the panel, next slide, um, I will lay a foundation for our topic of discussion. And this will be um, talking about personal care products and women's health, but what are personal care products and what are the chemicals that are in personal care products and why are they in them? And then why do we care? Next slide. 
So in general, personal care products are vast. Um, they include many categories, including hair care, feminine care, deodorants, etc. Next slide. And as vast as the categories are, so, so are the possible health links and their use. The use of these categories of uh, personal care products have been associated with menstrual cycle characteristics or a woman's characteristics for her period, um, breast cancer risk, endometriosis, uterine fibroids, so forth and so on. Now, given the multitude of products, next slide, um, you imagine, okay, oh, go back one, please. You would imagine that, um, these products would affect us all, right? So not just women of color. Um, however, what I'd like to do is present hair care products as a case study of why the impacts of toxic personal care products and cosmetics are of concern for girls and women of color. So next slide. So hair care product categories are just as vast. They include everything, um, next slide. They include everything from hair oils to hair lotions to root stimulators, etc. But while varied in the type or the categories that they have, their application is universal. These products are applied directly to the hair and or the scalp and absorbed into the skin. And multiple studies have shown that many of these hair care products have potentially harmful chemicals. One class of chemicals are known as endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs. Therefore, by the name alone, you can imagine that endocrine disrupting chemicals interrupt the endocrine system. Now, the endocrine system is a collection of glands that regulate and produce your natural hormones. And your natural hormones are important for regulating metabolism, growth and development, tissue function, sexual function, reproduction, sleep, mood, among so many other things. Now, collectively, EDCs are added to hair care products to enhance the product. For example, synthetic estrogen, commonly in the form of placenta, is added to products to enhance or encourage hair growth. Parabens are commonly added to prolong the shelf life or the preservation of a product, and phthalates are added for the scent of a product. Now, if you imagine EDCs being added to these products and the routine use of these products, you can imagine that it can interfere with your natural hormone production that could lead to downstream hormone-related health issues. Next slide. And I don't think it comes to anyone's surprise that women and ethnic minorities tend to be frequent and long-term users of these products given hair texture and the hair's added needs. Next slide. So um, I wanted to give you um, some um, basic data that was done by the Silent Spring Institute in Massachusetts, where researchers screened 66 chemicals in 18 hair care products that span six hair categories commonly used by um, black women. This included things like um, hot oil treatments, perms and relaxers, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's important to note here is they displayed their findings in a heat map. The darker the color indicates the greater the concentration of that chemical in that particular product. On the top, you can see numbers, and that indicates how many chemicals are present in that one product. And on the right, you see numbers that indicate how many products that chemical is within a product. Now, overall, what this indicates is that um, they found that 45 out of 66 of the chemicals tested were endocrine disrupting chemicals or even asthma associated. So these chemicals are prevalent in all categories of the products that are used by women of color, albeit at different concentrations. What was also noteworthy about this study is that they found that some of the detected chemicals were actually not on the product's ingredient list. 
and more of concern were that even products like no lie relaxers, which are targeted to children, have chemicals in them that are potentially harmful. Um, the no lie relaxers that they tested contained four endocrine disrupting chemicals that are prohibited by the European Union Cosmetic Directive. And the EU Cosmetic Directive is an organization that has stricter guidelines than current US regula regulations. Now, in parallel to this, knowing the frequency and the number of products that a woman may use and the longevity um, of a product, you can imagine that. Um, we're concerned about health issues. So what is noteworthy to know is that girls and women of color, especially women of African descent, have a higher burden of hormone-related health issues. Now, this includes for our girls earlier onset of puberty. So this is earlier age of breast development and an earlier age of starting one's period, both which are risk factors for breast cancer risk in later life. Um, women of color are also known to have higher rates of breast cancer, endometrial cancer, as well as uterine fibroids. Um, now, to be clear, as an epidemiologist, um, we cannot universally say these products cause hormone-related issues, um, nor can we say that these issues are solely for women of color, as these products are used amongst a mass of um, women and men. But however, what is of main concern is that there's a high correlation of the use of these products among girls and women of color across the life course, starting in early life, starting in childhood. And there's also the um, observance of health conditions at higher rates in girls and women of color. Next slide. So in fact, I raise that point because as an epidemiologist, we cannot say that universally these products cause hormone-related health issues. It is the correlation and the associations. And when you look at the evidence, while not all studies indicate a positive, a positive association between personal care product use and female reproductive health, when you take the preponderance of the evidence, everything from population-based studies, from animal models to cell-based studies, the majority of the evidence supports that these chemicals within these products have health-related activities. Next slide. So here I've just given you some of the growing most recent evidence related to um, personal care product exposure as well as specific chemical exposure as it relates to women's health. Um, highlighting the ones that are significant, but also giving a note to there are studies that show null associations. So for example, there has been consistent associations between childhood hair care product use and earlier age at menarche or an earlier age at starting one's period. Um, there's also been associations between personal care product use and greater breast cancer risk and greater risk of fibroids. However, genital powder use was not found to be associated with ovarian cancer, but authors did note that they did not have the appropriate sample size to see small effects. And even when we look at chemical exposures, a recent study has shown that parabens um, is associated with worse outcomes for breast cancer specific mortality, such as higher concentrations of parabens was associated with um, shorter lifespan of this due to breast cancer specific mortality. Now, inconsistencies in reports could be due to a number of things, but one of the things that um, is having growing appreciation is the timing of these exposures. There's a growing appreciation for the impact of exposures during biologically relevant windows, or in other words, windows where exposures may directly impact development. When we think about breast cancer risk, we think about the period of time where the breast tissue is highly sensitive, highly proliferative, always changing. And this would be in utero, the pubertal period, pregnancy, and the postpartum windows. So lastly, um, one thing I want to note is we're focusing personal care products for a very good reason, but let me just say that this shouldn't be taken lightly because um, EDC exposure comes in a variety of forms. Studies have shown that EDCs are present in food packaging, medicine, and insecticides. 
So when we think about our daily activities, our exposures are complex, they're multifaceted, but they're also consistent. So how do we tackle and mitigate these exposures that we actually can do something about, that regulations can actually improve? Well, I let Ludna Ahmed from WE Act begin to answer this question as their work in Northern Manhattan reflects the steps needed to tackle the environmental justice of beauty. And I've also provided for our participants um, on the next slide some references um, in case you wanna do further insight into the topic. And um, this is Corrine. Before we pass it on to uh, Lubna, I wanted to first um, acknowledge Osara Minokalo is on our line. She serves as the Senior Health Policy Advisor for Congresswoman Jan Tchaikovsky. Um, she, and uh, Congressman Tchaikovsky is a senior member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and chair of Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee. Um, Osaraman, um, Osaraman, sorry, she manages the Congresswoman's legislation and policy on all issues regarding health care. And so we wanted to uh, let her have some time to just talk about the development of this piece of legislation and, and what it means to uh, Congressman Jan Tchaikovsky. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Um, so I'm Mr. Romero Colo. Thank you all for um, to participate and interrupt this awesome panel. It's so exciting that this is happening. I know we wish that we could be all together in person, but um, we are all staying safe at home. I'm happy that we're still able to have this discussion um, despite all that's happening in our world right now. But I wanted to give you all some background on the Congressman's legislation and sort of how it was form formulated and um, sort of the detail of it. I don't know that if I missed that that occurred before, but I'm happy to stick around and answer specific questions to legislation after as well. So um, Congressman Jan Schakowsky introduced the Safe Cosmetics and Personal Care Products Act on September 12th, 2019. Um, she has introduced this legislation since 2010 with the help of the Safe Cosmetics Campaign, the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics, um, the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners and several other stakeholders. And so this is, you know, one of many iterations of this bill. We're really excited because for the first time this Congress, we really were able to include environmental justice provisions okay. into legislation. And I'll touch on that more later, but. You don't worry about it now. Um, I wanted to just explain the bill currently has 38 co-sponsors and House of representatives, which is the most that we've ever had. And it's been endorsed by over 50 of the nation's leading clean cosmetics companies and the most respected NGOs that represent women's health, environmental health and justice, occupational health, and children's health. Um, we act as one of those groups, and we're so grateful for your support. Um, Congressman Chakowsky started her career as a consumer advocate, and she's sort of led, actually led the fight that put freshness dates on products in the supermarket. Um, so she's always been really committed to fighting for public interest and issues that impact the most vulnerable among us. Um, so her bill is really the progressive standard bearer for a robust regulatory framework to ensure the safety of cosmetics and personal care products. Um, the bill would sort of close major loopholes in federal law, existing law that allow companies to use nearly any ingredient um, in cosmetics right now even chemicals that are known to harm human health and the environment, like formaldehyde, lead acetate, parabens, phthalates. Um, and, you know, I think maybe participants on this panel and most Americans really do believe that the Food and Drug Administration regulates cosmetics and personal care products the same way that they regulate food and drugs um, to ensure that the products are safe. But that's simply not true because cosmetics are one of the most reg least regulated products in the market today. And unlike drugs and unlike food, all cosmetics personal care products do not and their ingredients do not require FDA approval or review before they go onto the market. FDA currently has no authority to order a recall. So if, you know, like all the money the products we're discussing today, if we find that there's a dangerous product on the market, FDA can recommend and ask the company engage in a recall, but they have no authority to mandate one. But our bill, Congressman Joukowsky's bill, would change all of that. It requires mandatory recall of personal care products that do not meet the strong safety standard established by the bill, a safety standard that particularly incorporates vulnerable populations um, into that standard and protecting them. 
Um, and you know, the $84 billion cosmetics industry uses almost 13,000 unique chemical ingredients in personal care products. And the vast majority have never been assessed by any publicly accountable body. Um, and you know, black women are more likely to use, I mean, the average American uses 12, an average of 12 personal care products a day, but black women are on average use an even higher amount than that, resulting in an exposure to over 168 unique chemicals. And so these chemicals have been linked to cancer, infertility, miscarriage, poor infant maternal health outcomes, obesity, asthma, and they're a danger for everyone, but we found the way the industry has targeted women of color um, and has particularly marketed dangerous products towards them puts them even more at risk. Um, and so personal care products impact all of us. And I think, but I think that companies know, you know, where, who they're selling them to and how they're selling them. I think we've learned in recent months or over the past year that, for example, Johnson & Johnson, um, who many of you probably know about their dangerous, their baby powder that is potentially caught, contaminated with asbestos, that after they found that their baby powder potentially contained asbestos, they purposefully engaged in a targeted market, a marketing campaign aimed at Black women and Latina women on Chicago's South Side. They gave away gift bags. They gave away free products and samples. And my boss and Congressman Presley and others have been you know, trying to engage in oversight of this company, but it's been difficult. Um, and I think we're only now starting to see the extent to which companies have not only engaged in sort of what they call multiracial marketing, but what is really targeted and dangerous marketing. Um, but so this bill would immediately ban uh, a dirty dozen of some of the most toxic chemicals in cosmetics and personal care products, and it would require manufacturers to register with the FDA and disclose all their ingredients, including secret fragrance ingredients. So the fragrance piece is particularly important as well. Um, and through our bill, the Secretary of Health and Human Services is, is also required to continually assess ingredients to determine whether they are safe or should be restricted. And most importantly, I think for this conversation, the bill would require the Secretary to consider communities that are disproportionately impacted by the products marketed to them, sort of through the examples that I've mentioned, because of their particular race, ethnicity, or occupation. So that could include salon workers as well. Um, so the bill would really, you know, in sum, provide cosmetic safety that consumers and workers want and deserve, address the overexposure to toxic chemicals that communities of color and professional salon workers experience every day, and would also hold companies accountable, companies like Johnson & Johnson, finally accountable for the safety of the ingredients in their products. And um, I just want to note that, you know, all the work that we do around this bill would be impossible without advocates and sort of the voices of folks grassroots on the outside. I think um, I was so excited about this conversation in particular because I think the more that people are aware of the way that our cosmetics industry is completely unregulated and the more that people are aware of the disparities in cosmetics and personal care products, the more sort of success we can have in finally advancing this legislation. Um, many people don't know that you know, the, the cosmetics industry, the personal care products council, the folks that sort of the, the trade, the industry association, they are more powerful and have more lobbying power than I think even big pharma and other groups that I think you are more, you hear more about more often about having power on Capitol Hill. And so it's gonna take a lot of work and effort to finally pass cosmetics regulatory legislation. Um, you may, uh, there is a bill that is moving through the Congress right now it is uh, the Chairman Pallone's cosmetics bill. And as that goes through our committee process, my boss helps the, serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee. We hope to strengthen and include aspects of our bill. Um, but I think, you know, even if we pass something through the House, it's unlikely that it passes through the Senate in our Republican controlled Senate. So this is going to continue this, this conversation, this effort and this fight will continue the, to, through this Congress and future Congresses, but it'll be, incredibly important for legislators to have outside grassroots support as we work to restore consumer confidence in the safety of beauty and personal care products. And as we work to sort of make safe cosmetics the new, the new normal. Um, and so I don't wanna go on and drone on forever. I could talk about this bill in details more, but if you have questions later, I'm happy to answer those. Um, but thank you all for being here.
Um, I hope that you all call your representatives and encourage them to co-sponsor this bill if they haven't already. It's HR 4296, the Safe Cosmetics and Personal Care Products Act by Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. Thanks. All right, thank you so much for that. We really appreciate you coming on and we know how busy it is on the Hill. I'm gonna turn it over right now to my colleague at WEAC for Environmental Justice, Alumna Ahmed. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. We can hear you. I'll take that as yes. <laughs> Okay, um, great. So, um, as Kareen mentioned, uh, my name is Lob Nahmed, Director of Environmental Health at WEAC for Environmental Justice. And um, I wanted to just uh, kind of do a little bit more framing around the environmental injustice to beauty, talk a bit about our Beauty Inside Out campaign, um, some of the local work that we've been doing, community engagement around the campaign and uh, talk about some um, of the project activities and, and what we found so far. Uh, next slide, okay. Um, so in terms of the environmental injustice of beauty, we just want to be really clear about what we're talking about. Um, and this is really focusing on cosmetics, cosmetics marketed to women and particularly women of color that really do contain some of the most toxic chemicals um, used by the beauty industry. Um, beauty standards push women to expose themselves to harmful products. Um, there are marketing strategies that specifically target women of color and young girls of color. Um, and workers in the beauty industry are predominantly women of color and immigrant women. Um, and so these are, you know, you know kind of the, the basis, the, the facts in which we have um, started the Beauty Inside Out campaign. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to um, just quickly talk about some of our community engagement. Um, and we really did start to introduce or launch a Beauty Inside Out campaign in January uh, of last year. And uh, we kind of started this off by doing a community briefing. This was in conjunction with the Columbia Children's Center as well as the Center for Environmental Health, um, where we engaged in a community dialogue on this topic. Um, since then, we've had several other events. Uh, for example, we led a membership meeting. Um, we act again as a is a grassroots nonprofit organization based in West Harlem. We operate through a membership base um, of over 800 local residents. Um, we have monthly membership meetings, and at one of our membership meetings, um, Dr. Jasmine McDonald, who spoke earlier, uh, was a guest and really uh, talked about you know, toxicity of personal care products, specifically hair products that are um, used by black women and for Caribbean women. Um, we have held um, several community conversations. Um, some of these images that you're seeing are from those events. Um, we have a series called Uptown Chats where, um, you know, we again engage in a dialogue with community um, and it's really an exchange, you know, it's us delivering information, but um, also gives people an opportunity to um, a dialogue with um, folks that they might not typically be able to, including elected officials, um, scientists, um, you know, other types of community experts. Um, in addition to that, we have included um, some information about this topic uh, related to toxics and personal care products into our environmental health and justice data training, which we call EHJLT. Um, and this has been a really hot topic amongst the students where we teach EHJLT. Um, many, many people have um, taken a liking to this topic, have developed student projects around it. Um, this image that you see in the bottom right um, are a group of uh, women um, at a local high school here that um, decided to expand one of class projects on this. And um, it's really, really incredible to see uh, what young people, um, what they take away from learning about this topic. Next slide. Um, so I also wanted to talk specifically about a survey administration project that we introduced through the BD Inside Out campaign. Um, could we get uh, next slide, please? Um, so this is going to be pressing my in my hand, but um, I'll just go ahead and talk about um, the cosmetic survey project 
And basically, you know, the again, the premise, the background around the project is that there is a European standard of beauty that has penetrated all racial groups um, and has encouraged skin whitening and hair straightening, um, which shows a long-term uh, which does pose long-term health problems and worsens health disparities, um, such as a higher rate of breast cancer uh, in women of color um, that are using these products. Um, our goal of the survey demonstration project, which we launched again through the Beauty Inside Out campaign, is to collect really high quality data um, to really amplify this can campaign against toxic chemicals um, in, in cosmetics. Uh, one of the main activities that we had established is that we wanted to collect about four to 500 surveys amongst women of color in northern Manhattan to specifically ask about their use of um, uh, skin lightening products and hair straightening products, as well as their attitudes and perceptions towards those products. And again, we're specifically focusing on skin lighteners and hair straighteners because these products are consistently at the intersection of um, you know, commonly used products, toxicity, as well as race. Uh, next slide. So I uh, wanted to highlight some of the project activities that we've had um, since the launch of this project. We've done extensive literature reviews. We've done some store inventories. We've gone around to local shops, to, you know, I think from corner, corner store to major retailers, to CDS, Dwayne Reed. Um, we've investigated, you know, what kind of products are being sold on the shelves right here in this community. Um, based on that, we started to design a survey um, in both English and in Spanish. We piloted the survey uh, among both um, English speakers and Spanish speakers. The survey went through the um, through Yale, Army, which is a partner that we're currently working with. Um, and then we led uh, some focus groups and several uh, survey administration trainings. Um, as of a couple of weeks ago, uh, you can click next slide, please. As of a couple of weeks ago, we had administered a total of 217 stays. Um, obviously, you know, give everyone the uh, survey temporarily, temporarily suspended. Um, but with 217 surveys, we have collected a lot, a lot of rich data. Um, and I wanted to highlight some of those here, uh, hopefully folks can see this. Um, next slide. Um, so some of the interesting finds that we found from just very preliminary results, um, again, out of the 217 women that we surveyed, uh, is that 40% of them uh, said that they have used a chemical straightener, chemical hair straightener, uh, the average age that women report first using um, a straightener is about 14 years old and starting as young as four. Um, some important factors for selecting a straightener were effectiveness, um, price point, how long lasting it would be. Um, however, the ingredients that are in those products was um, amongst the lowest rank. Um, you know, people didn't really select that option very much. Um, also, in terms of personal reasons for using straighteners, the most popularly selected um, statement was that women were saying that they feel more beautiful with straight hair. Um, with regard to skin lighteners, in terms of our preliminary findings, 23% um, of women uh, answered that they do use or have used some sort of skin whitening or skin lightening product. Um, of those 23%, um, 68% said that they have used these products in the past 12 months. 37% um, of those women said they use it on their entire face. So, you know, this is not just for dark spot correcting. It's a lightening of the entire appearance. Um, and about half of the women that responded yes to using skin lighteners said they um, were not really concerned about the ingredients in that product. Um, so those were just some like really interesting takeaways just from this kind of half um, half of surveys that we've administered uh, in phase two, which we'll pick up uh, once things kind of resume back normal and uh, people can get out there and surveying again. Uh, phase two will be expanded to include um, young girls, adolescent girls between the age of 13 and 17, uh, as we are really great to learn a little bit more about, um, you know, popular trends amongst uh, that age group as well. 
So um, I just want to conclude here by um, emphasizing that, you know, focusing on this topic um, is really apparent that um, these results are really mirroring what, what we understand uh, or what we kind of expected to learn. Um, and it is really imperative that, you know, we use this type of quantitative data to, to support efforts to push legislative reform as well as industry and marketplace reform. Um, and I'll turn it over now to Kim Smith from the Brown Beauty Co-op to um, talk a little bit more about that. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Kimberly Smith, um, and I am the founder of Marjani and the co-founder of the Brown Beauty Co-op. Uh, Marjani is a beauty retailer. Um, it's a beauty boutique um, specifically for women of color, um, and we specialize in skincare, cosmetics, and bath and body. I uh, co-own the Brown Beauty Co-op, which is a cooperative space uh, located here in D.C. with uh, a business partner who uh, started a natural hair startup. And so what we do um, collectively at the co-op is we not only have a retail space, but uh, we, also use, um, we also use our space to provide education and we produce educational events around, um, around beauty and reaching the consumer in real time. And so um, one of my biggest questions and one of you know, my responsibilities as a retailer, I always ask is, what is the responsibility of the retailer? Uh, the retailer is the, is the organization, is the company that collects all of these products and what type of onus do we put on the retailer? Um, keeping in mind that there are no um, regulations at the moment that, reg that regulates what's inside of the products. So what are we doing as far as identifying what products to put on our shelves? Um, so for me, as a woman of color, I approach this as a consumer. What is it that, um, what is safe for me to consume, um, thereby what is safe for other women, women of color to consume? So when we think about, um, you know, a vetting process, sorry, next slide, um, we have to look as consumers um, and hoping that other retailers are, you know, we have to put their feet to the fire and understand how they are sourcing the products. So at a store like mine, and there's a lot of other, um, other beauty companies that are really at the forefront of providing clean beauty spaces, but they're not, there aren't many that are really keeping um, women of color specifically um, as the priority. So for us, we, we have incorporated a vetting process where we look to not only um, the effectiveness of products, but we want to look to the quality of products. And that's really looking at the performance and safety. Um, so we want a product to work, but we should not have to make a compromise if we're choosing between a product working and a product being safe to use. Um, and also product knowledge is really key. When we're going into different retailers, oftentimes we're not meeting individuals that, um, that have the product knowledge and understand what is, being, um, what is being used in certain products. And so we're almost, we're asking the consumer to um, almost go back to school in a sense and have you know, a, college educa a college, a science level education when it comes to reading the ingredients, understanding potential adverse effects that ingredient, the ingredients have um, on our health. So for us um, at Marjani, we do look um, to understand what is natural versus synthetic and understanding that just because something is natural doesn't mean that it's good for you. And um, just because something is synthetic doesn't mean that it's bad for you. Um, but really understanding uh, specifically what those ingredients are and being able to um, teach the consumer what those ingredients mean. Um, as we know that a lot of the ingredients can be really long and we don't understand in layman's terms, um, but having that product knowledge is really important, I think, um, when customers are going into different retailers and they are purchasing their personal care products. Um, one term for me that is really important, and that is non-toxic. To me, that is far more important um, than the terms of natural and, and, um, and organic because we know that those terms are not, are, have not been defined. So non-toxic to me is something that, that equivalates to being safe. And so when we are sourcing different products to put on our shelves, we are looking at the safety factors in the products. 
um, and then vegan and cruelty free. I wanted to put certain terms in here that for the consumer that are constantly being um, thrown out when it comes to personal care products. We're, we're seeing natural, we're seeing organic, we're seeing certified organic, we're seeing non-toxic, non but to the average consumer, they're not understanding what those what those terms mean. Um, so I think it's really important for us to start to be able to define those products, um, to, sorry, to define those terms so as consumers, they understand um, what's, uh, what is being sold to them versus you know, um, the message and the marketing um, that's being told to us. So I think overall, without objective, clear guidance and regulations, we are self, we are setting the standards ourselves within an industry that right now is, is clearly divided. Um, so I think it's really important now more than ever um, for, for the U.S. to really, um, you know, start holding different companies, hold their feet to the fire so that we are making um, products that are truly safe. And then the marketing tactics are, um, are, are, are being, excuse me, that the marketing tactics um, towards women of color um, are not being disproportionately, um, you know, to our disadvantage. And so with that, um, I started talking about um, different terms that are used to define certain chemicals. Now we're going to move into um, a, a more detailed conversation about chemicals used in products. All right, we're going to keep this webinar going. I'm going to um, turn it over to Janet Noodleman, Director of Policy Pro Program and Policy with the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics. Thanks, Janet. Thank you, Corrine, and thank you to the over 300 people that have registered for today's webinar speaking to the, the broad-based interest in this topic. As we've heard from Kimberly, some segments of the cosmetics industry, like Brown Beauty Co-op, are responding with voluntary changes and making and selling the safer products that women of color are demanding. This is so important and consumers should support companies that are making and selling safer products simply because they believe it is the right thing to do, not because they are being legally required to do so. However, at the end of the day, we need a government that protects all of us from toxic chemicals in the toxic products made by companies that treat cosmetic safety as if it's the Wild West, not just the people that know of or can afford the safer products. For over a decade, BCPP's Campaign for Safe Cosmetics has been working to secure passage of meaningful health protective federal legislation that gives the Food and Drug Administration the statutory authority it needs to ensure cosmetics and personal care products are safe for people and the planet. As Corrine mentioned, the federal law that governs the $100 billion domestic cosmetics industry is two and a half pages long and has not been amended significantly since it was enacted 80 years ago. To make matters worse, there is no federal or global oversight of any kind of the $70 billion fragrance industry that provides the ingredients that make our personal care and beauty products smell good even though fragrance ingredients make up the majority of the ingredients in an individual cosmetic product. And as you've heard from all of the panelists, this means companies can and do legally use chemicals linked to cancer, birth defects, hormone disruption, learning disabilities, and reproductive and respiratory harm in the cosmetic products that are used every day by consumers and workers, many of whom are women of color. Can you advance uh, two more slides, please? There we go, you can stop there. This slide shows just a handful of the toxic chemicals that are legally used in products sold in the US but are banned by the European Union. As Dr. McDonald shared earlier, in total, the EU bans 1,328 chemicals from cosmetics used in, co from chemicals used in cosmetics including formaldehyde, asbestos, and coal tar that are known or suspected to cause cancer, genetic mutation, reproductive harm, or birth defects. The FDA, in comparison, has only banned or restricted 11 chemicals from cosmetics used in the United States. Next slide, please. Most people logically think that the FDA regulates the safety of beauty and personal care products 
the same way that it does food and drugs. The reality couldn't be further from the truth. Cosmetics sold in the United States are one of the least regulated product sectors today. In fact, 40 nations have stricter cosmetic safety policies than we do. The FDA does not conduct pre-market safety testing or review of cosmetic ingredients or finished products, nor does it require companies to test cosmetic ingredients in their products for safety before they are placed on, st on store shelves. The FDA can't even require a recall of harmful cosmetic products. This includes products currently being sold today that are causing respiratory harm and damaging the lungs of hair salon workers, as is the case with a Brazilian blowout hair straightening product, which contains more formaldehyde than an undertaker uses to embalm a dead person. Wow. And, <laughs> and products that are threatening children's and women's health as was the case with asbestos-contaminated baby powder sold by Johnson & Johnson and kids, kids' cosmetics sold by Claire's and other retailers. Next slide, please. Fortunately, the public is demanding federal cosmetic safety reform that provides consumers, salon workers, and highly impacted communities of color with the safer products and strengthened ingredient disclosure that they want and deserve. We believe that the gold standard for federal cosmetic safety is the Safe Cosmetics and Personal Care Products Act, H.R. 4296, introduced in August by Representative Jan Schakowsky. You heard from her staff person, Osaraman, about some of its key provisions, but I want to re-mention just a couple of them now. The Safe Cosmetics Act is the only federal cosmetic safety bill that mandates full ingredient, full, I'm sorry, full fragrance ingredient disclosure, it's worth saying twice, across the entire supply chain, from cosmetic companies to the FDA, from fragrance suppliers to cosmetic companies, and from cosmetic companies to consumers. It also funds research into the beauty products and the chemicals of concern they contain marketed to women and girls of color, and public outreach to help impacted communities avoid these toxic exposures. It supports the creation of safer alternatives to the toxic chemicals in professional salon products and products marketed to women of color, and it protects the rights of the states to legislate on cosmetic safety. Next slide, please. Another important bill that we'll be discussing today was introduced in the House of Representatives in mid-December by Representative Frank Pallone from New Jersey, the powerful chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, the committee with jurisdiction over cosmetic safety. His bill, H.R. 5279, the Cosmetic Safety Enhancement Act of 2019, will serve as the vehicle through which any House cosmetic safety regulatory reform will take place. Representative Pallone's bill includes a number of important provisions that will bring the FDA's regulation of cosmetic safety into the 21st century. His bill requires cosmetic companies to notify the FDA of adverse, event, adverse events associated with their cosmetic products. It requires cosmetic companies to substantiate the safety of ingredients in their products. It empowers the FDA to conduct safety reviews of cosmetic ingredients and ensure mandatory recalls of products causing serious harm to human health. And it requires companies to register their facilities, their products, and their ingredients with the FDA, with the exception, unfortunately, of fragrance ingredients. Next slide, please. Representative Pallone has been a very good friend to the environmental health movement. And we know he cares deeply about addressing toxic chemical exposures and preserving the rights of states to legislate on cosmetic safety. However, the big multinational cosmetic companies and fragrance suppliers and the trade associations and the law firms that represent them are aggressively lobbying to preserve a federal labeling loophole, which allows fragrance houses to keep secret the chemicals that make up the fragrance in beauty and personal care products from cosmetic companies and consumers and even the FDA, its regulatory agency. I'm not just talking about fine fragrances or perfumes, 
but also the majority of hair and body care products, shampoos, conditioners, styling gels, lotions, bubble baths, shaving creams, deodorants, sunscreens, etc. This is a problem because chemicals with known links to adverse human health effects, even chemicals listed by the EPA as hazardous air contaminants, can legally hide without the public's knowledge or consent under that one little word fragrance on product labels. If these special interests are, su are successful in blocking fragrance ingredient disclosure, manufacturers will not be able to fully substantiate the safety of their products and the FDA will not get the full ingredient disclosure that it needs to effectively regulate cosmetic safety. And thus, consumers and workers will continue to face a buyer beware situation and a continued lack of confidence in the safety of their beauty and personal care products because no one will be minding the store in terms of the safety of fragrance chemicals. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, can you, can you return to the earlier slide, please? Thanks. Where Representative Pallone's bill is marked up by the Full Energy and Commerce Committee, amendments from Representative Schakowsky's bill will make his good bill even better and are needed to help address many of the issues and concerns raised today. These are protections we believe should be included in any federal cosmetic safety bill. Specifically, we are urging House Energy and Commerce Committee members, and we're asking you to do so as well, to support amendments which would first provide funding to the NIHS, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, to research the specific chemicals in products marketed to women of color, the questionable tactics mentioned by Osiraman earlier used by companies to market these products, and community education and interventions to respond to the problem. We are also looking for amendments to fund green chemistry safer alternatives to the toxic chemicals and products marketed to women of color and used by professional hair, nail, and beauty salon workers. An amendment that would require fragrance ingredient disclosure across the entire supply chain. And finally, an amendment that would, would require supply chain transparency. So manufacturers can get the ingredient disclosure, the toxicity and safety data, and the certificates of purity that they need from their suppliers so that they can make safer products for all of us. Next slide, please. These same special interests also want to preempt the states from legislating on cosmetic safety, or forcing more ingredient disclosure, especially when it comes to fragrance ingredient disclosure. Individual states like California, New York, Maryland, Connecticut, Washington, Vermont, Minnesota, and Alaska, rather than the federal government, have led the way in passing environmental health protections and should maintain that right to protect citizens from unsafe chemical exposures. Next slide, please. So what can you do as an individual to safeguard your health and the health of your family from toxic chemicals and the beauty and personal care products that you use every day? For, first of all, you can become a smarter shopper and research and better understand the safety of the chemicals in the cosmetic products that you use every day. You can and you should patronize the clean cosmetics companies that fully, in, that fully disclose the fragrance ingredients in their products and that make safer products. And there are hundreds of them currently serving consumers today. We're also asking you to support the Safe Cosmetics Act and to support strengthening Representative Pallone's cos, uh, Cosmetic Safety Enhancement Act. I think I got that name wrong, sorry when it reaches the Energy and Commerce Committee for its review and markup. And finally, you should join the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics and We Act for Environmental Justice and other NGOs that are working hard to bring you safer cosmetics. Thank you, Corrine, and back to you.
Hey, Kareen, you're on mute. I'm <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that. So um, we see that there have been a number of questions and we've tried to answer some in real time via the chat, but there's still a few that are open. And so I'm going to uh, manage this process. The first question is for Kimberly from Donna Robinson. Um, can you please further explain the statement you made uh, where you said just because a product is labeled as natural doesn't mean that it's good for you. And just because a product is synthetic doesn't mean that it's bad for you. Can you um, kind of clarify that statement, please? That's for Kimberly. Kimberly? Oh, she might be on mute. Let's see if I can unmute her. Um, okay, I'll move on to the next question. We can come back to that one. Um, and so this, this is a regulatory question. Oh, Saraman, if you're there, um, this one is, have you spoken to regulatory professionals in the industry in order to partner with them for this bill? So I think as Janet, you know, covered so ex like in, in her expert manner, industry is loath to support cosmetics regulation. I think when you have gone 80 plus years without being regulated, it's rare that you would you'd want to fall under under a strict regulatory scheme. Um, I will say that clean beauty industry though has been supportive. Um, beauty counter comes to mind as quite a large company, private company that's been supportive of our legislation and has endorsed as well as endorsing Mr. Pallone's bill, uh, Biosense, I hope you're saying that wrong. And you know, other clean beauty companies have been supportive. So we've certainly spoken to them about our legislation and they have endorsed it and are supportive. Um, I mean, I continue to converse with other piece, parts of industry as well um, in this process. And I think there are some pieces that, you know, they've somewhat supported, I think you could say. Um, Janet, I don't know if you wanna talk about the companies that have given some transparency to, um, listing some ingredients on their website or listing some levels of, of fragrance on their website. But, you know, nothing has been as robust as what would be enacted through Congressman Chikasi's legislation or, you know, even Congressman Pallone's legislation. So um, I think, as you might be able to imagine, it's hard to want to want to, to support something that would, that would force you to, you know, change the ways that you're used to. But there are some industry partners who have been, who understand the importance. Um, of our work. Yeah, I'll just add uh, that uh, to Osaraman's point, uh, the very first major multinational to voluntarily disclose fragrance ingredients was Unilever. Uh, they were followed by Procter & Gamble and more recently by Johnson & Johnson, but J&J &J is just disclosing in their baby products. And all three of these companies are only disclosing fragrance ingredients down to 100 points parts per million. Um, which is a problem because um, lots and lots and lots of fragrance chemicals can be present at much smaller concentrations. And we know from what we heard earlier uh, from Dr. McDonald um, that endocrine disrupting compounds can be present at very small levels and can be biologically active at parts per million or even parts per trillion. Um, the good news is that hundreds and hundreds of clean cosmetics companies are voluntarily disclosing fragrance ingredients um, at, the, at whatever level they're present. So we think the big companies can too, and that's why Representative Schakowsky's bill uh, is, is asking for full ingredient disclosure, and we're asking that Representative Pallone amend his bill to do the same. Would anyone like to, um, I guess, clarify the distinction between the use of language. Uh, I know this question was targeted to um, Kimberly, but just something in reference to something being labeled natural, whether it's healthy or good for you versus something synthetic and whether that, that might not be good for you as well. So I can do that unless, um, I'm not sure if Kimberly wants to jump in, but um, the, the words natural and safe 
have absolutely no meaning in federal law. Um, any cosmetic company can call any ingredient whatever they want to uh, without any kind of federal oversight or penalty for doing so. And that is why consumers and workers face a buyer beware situation uh, because lots and lots of companies are greenwashing their products by calling them natural, by calling them non-toxic when they really aren't. Um, and they're pink washing their products and using breast carcinogens while supporting supposedly uh, breast cancer treatment and services. And both are real problems. Sorry, guys, I was pressing the wrong button to unmute myself. Go ahead, Kimberly. <laughs> yeah, this is Kimberly. And yes, I, I totally agree. Um, and I speak with consumers every day. And I think what has happened is we have almost created this like consumer fear where customers are coming in and because they're not aware of what certain terms mean and not understanding that those terms are not defined, um, then they come in just wanting to, I want everything all natural. And then what has to happen at the retail level, you need to speak with someone who can actually guide you through ingredients so that you understand that just because something says that it's natural, one, what is it? What are they saying is natural? Um, but then kind of, you know, really educating on it. Stop using these terms, but let's really understand what the product is, what it's supposed to do, and what the product is made of. Um, and I think it's a, it's, it's a heavy call, I guess, to for retailers to do this. But I think um, it really comes down to the integrity and understanding that there are really, um, you know, there, there can be dangerous effects with certain products. And so if you're going to sell them to the public, then you should be aware of exactly what you're selling. And um, those terms, for sure, it kind of burns me up because I know that there's so many consumers that are now, you know, they're on the fearful side because they don't understand what these terms mean. Um, and then we're just using all these wrong marketing tactics to, um, you know, to equivalent to equate natural and organic with safe when it doesn't really mean that. So I would just say as a consumer, you just have to, you know, in this time, you have to educate yourself on what the ingredients actually are um, and go from there and figure out what is going to be best for you, but just move away from the marketing of what safe is and what organic is, knowing that these companies, um, you know, that they are not defined, that should kind of help you out just to be, be more educated. And that's something we all have to do and share this education with others that are, that are shopping in the personal care market. Thank you. Um, we have another question. This one's for Janet. Um, it's in regards to, I guess, celebrity awareness about the campaign. I, I guess the question is, uh, this person saw a study um, that Cody fragrances for Halle Berry and JLo and Beyonce were heavy and they were heavily in, I guess, in a, their awareness of phthalates. So do those celebrities or other celebrities, are there, is there a growing awareness, I guess, of celebrities in this area? So that is such a good question. Um, Jess, first to respond to the, to the problem that was raised by the, the participant, uh, BCPP, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, my organization, released a report last year called Right to Know Secret Fragrance Chemicals in Personal Care and Cleaning Products. Uh, and we tested 40 personal care, beauty, and, um, and cleaning products for the fragrance ingredients hiding in those products. Um, the, the most shocking thing that we discovered was the very most toxic product, and that means the, the product that contained the most toxic chemicals was a, a shampoo marketed to kids of color called Just For Me. Um, and it's made by um, an international hair care product called Strength of Nature. And this product contained 24 chemicals of concern, 17 of which were fragrance ingredients. So that meant 17 of the ingredients didn't even show up on the product label. And um, um, this is outrageous because the product was more toxic than, than the cleaning products, than the tub and tile cleaner and the spot remover that we tested as well. So um, that causes, of course, um, is a real cause of concern. Um, but to answer your question, the, among the 10 top most toxic products was a perfume marketed by Jennifer Lopez called J-Lo Glow, as well as a product marketed by Taylor Swift called Taylor Swift Wonderstruck, 
a couple of products marketed by Cody and Estee Lauder, including their iconic white linen product. So these celebrities are endorsing toxic products, um, plain and simple. Um, do they know what, you know what they're doing and the extent of the problem? I don't know because I personally don't have access to them. Um, but um, it's a real problem, and I I would think that they should get behind this effort because they use so many cosmetics every day, um, and because of um, um, the their profession, plain and simple. Okay, um, I'm looking here in the Q and A box. Let's see if there are any additional questions. Well, one question that has come up in different forms is um, folks who are doing their own work uh, locally or they want to connect more, um, please, um, you know, please visit our own respective websites. Uh, I think if, you, if Dana, you can pull up the, 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 the slide with all of our websites, but please connect with us via our own websites um, directly and to follow up with us. Um, we try to share um, as we were moving through the, um, the emails and the social media handles for the presenters, but I think that will be an opportunity to follow up. We also will be following up um, from this webinar with the actual slides that we shared, some one pagers, some research documents, and just some more information to not only um, continue this dialogue, but to educate you all as much as possible since we had such a great turnout. And I appreciate those who were able to stick it out. You know, we're still over 100 people um, here present on the webinar. So I, that really speaks to the importance of this conversation. Um, but please, you know, connect with us on our websites. Um, uh, Breast Cancer Partnership is bcpp.org. Their um, campaign, uh, uh, the targeted program, Safe Cosmetics is safecosmetics.org. And we act, we're at weact.org. Um, and again, you know, in addition to what we've recommended in terms of our efforts to um, bolster the Pallone bill to have some stronger provisions. We do want to remind you all that as consumers, that as um, everyday people, you have the power and the ability to also dictate what's going on in the market, not only by informing yourself, but demanding that the stores that you frequent, you know, start carrying products that, um, that are more in line with protecting your health and that aren't, you know, filled with uh, the, a number of cosmetics, I'm sorry, a number of chemicals that we know that um, will, you know, impact us negatively. But we want to continue this conversation. We're going to wrap it up. I think we've um, answered the majority of questions. Um, I wanted to thank all of our panelists for being on. Um, Peggy, Kimberly, um, Osa Rahman from Congresswoman Jane Schakowsky's office, Janet from Breast Cancer Partnership, Kimberly, let me make sure I get everyone, uh, Lubna from WE Act. Um, we really appreciate uh, them sharing their expertise with us today. Um, but most importantly, we appreciate everyone um, for coming and joining us. We hope to continue this um, not only um, online, but when things get back to normal, we hope to have an in-person meeting as we had intended. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of We Act for Environmental Justice, my name is Corrine, and I want to wish everyone a safe and productive day. Thank you so much. You all have a great day.